I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. The Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life for the sins of the world. The ho- John calls it the whole world, just in case you were wondering. But he didn't just lay down his life. Three days and three nights later, he took it again. He had power to do that. No man has ever had that power. And because he lives, we too can live through him. Thank God for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. All right. Memory work time. Uh, We got a big service this morning. The memory work this month. And this is the last day of the month. And then we start the new ones. So I'm going to go ahead and give the new memory work before I quote the memory work. I don't want to call it old. It ain't old. It never gets old. It never gets old. All right. Uh, The new memory work for April, starting tomorrow. Psalm 100, 1 and 2. Okay. Now, you get those down. You got a head start on... Uh, 20, is it next year? Next year. Because next year, 2025, is we get a psalm a month. We're going to memorize a whole psalm every month. But they're going to not be the bigger ones. They're going to be the smaller ones. And they're going to be good. And one of those psalms is Psalm 100. You guessed it. And uh, and so you'll already be two verses in. All right? If you want to go ahead and knock out the whole thing now, you'll be that much further ahead in 2025. Now, some don't believe we'll still be here in 2025. I wouldn't be disappointed if we weren't. If the Lord came back between now and then, I'd be just as happy as pie. But I'm going to work on those verses anyway, like we're going to be here. All right? And if we are here, we're going to quote them together. Our theme this year is service. Here's what Psalm 100, 1 and 2 says. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. That's two verses that quick. Boom, done. Okay. Now, our memory work this month, and here's the last day of it. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Well, I'm going to do 23 and 24. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. Amen. Brother Gabriel. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. Amen. Isaac. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. Good job, Miss Katie. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he Great job. Hazel. Hazel. I, 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 knew, I know her. <laughs> great job, Hazel. Someone else this morning. Brother Aaron. First Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he has done for you. Great job. Someone else this morning. Tim. Great job. Great job. Brother Lewis. Great job. Someone else this morning. Uh, Brother Roger. Great job. Miss Anna. For Samuel 1224. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he has done for you. Good job. Someone else this morning. Miss Emily. Samuel 1224. Only fear the Lord. Uh, 
promised land. First Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he has done for you. Great job. Someone else this morning. Tabitha. Great job. Good to have Tabitha with us. Brother Bryce. Great job. One else. Brother Ben up high. First Samuel twelve twenty four. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He has done for you. Great job. Marianne. Great job. Anybody else? All right. Let's open our Bibles together. First Samuel chapter twelve. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 24, and we'll read this aloud together, pausing at the punctuation marks. First Samuel 12, 24, the Bible says, Only fear the Lord, and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he has done for you. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you so loved the world that you gave him to us and for us. Lord, you gave him for the whole world. You give him to whosoever will. We thank you for that this morning. We thank you for the precious word of God. I pray that we would be faithful to hide your word in our hearts, that we might not sin against you, that we would esteem the words of your mouth more than our necessary food, that we would not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <coughs> Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Because he lives, page 149, we'll sing all three verses.
sing the first verse, the chorus, and go back to the first part. Standing together, page number 22. You don't know what's going on here, but I can sing without a mic back in the beginning. That's the way we did it. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he's to blame. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorn. They laughed and said, behold the king. They struck him and they cursed him. And they mopped his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, woman, behold my son. He cried, I thirst for water. 
but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful works of man was done. To the howling mob she yielded. He did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried his finish, he gave himself to die. Salvation wondrous plan was done. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. find the text this morning in the book of 2 John, toward the back of your Bible, 2 John. It's one of the smaller epistles of the New Testament and books of the Bible, consisting of just 13 verses. 2 John, you'll find it right between 1 and 3 John, if you're having trouble finding it. All right, 2 John, when you found your place there, stand with me, please, if you're able to stand and honor the reading of the Word of God. I encourage you to have your Bible, hold your Bible, follow along in your Bible as I read aloud in your hearing, see the words, hear the words, believe the words. These are God's words. They're different than man's words. They're God's words, and we are to believe them. And then by the grace of God, we'll be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. And we'll trust that God's Holy Spirit will conform us more into the image of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that's why we're here today? We're here for a person, Jesus Christ. And we're here for a reason. That we may know Him, that we may be forgiven by Him if we're not already forgiven that we may commune with Him, walk with Him, and be conformed into His image. That's what God's doing uh, in the world today. He's working salvation among sinners, and He's conforming saints to the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's interested in sinners. He's interested in saints. If you're here today, God's interested in you. 2 John, beginning in verse 7, I'll read down through the end of the chapter the end of the book in your hearing, verse 13. 2 John, verse 7. Church, this is the Word of God. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee, Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity, the privilege, and the responsibility that we have as God's people to meet in God's house on this, the Lord's Day, that we may hear preaching, teaching from the Word of God, sing praises to your name, and, O oh God, pray to you and ask for your presence, your help, your blessing. And we do ask for that this morning. As we turn our attention to the Word of God, the preaching, the teaching of it, 
I pray that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher, our leader, our guide. I pray that you would open our eyes that we may build wondrous things out of thy law. Open our understanding that we may understand the scriptures. Give us ears to hear what your spirit saith unto the churches. And help us, O oh God, to receive what you have for us this morning. I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified, that the word of God would be magnified, that we thy needy people would be edified, and that you might brought, draw sinners to Jesus Christ in saving faith through what's done here and the results of what, are, what is done here today. Thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his death, his burial. Thank you, O oh God, for his resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. I've entitled the message this morning, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. You saw that phrase in verse 7, the opening verse of our text, where he said, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Well, the reality of it is, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. It's been observed that in the opening six verses of this epistle, which was our text last Sunday morning, John encourages truth. That's his theme, and it's coupled with love, but truth is his theme, and he encourages truth. And then here in the final seven verses, he turns to opposing error. Three things I want to note this morning. If you're keeping, taking notes or interested in the outline, three things, a connection a caution, and a conclusion. Those are the three things that we're going to look at this morning, three main things, and we'll build off of those. And so as John begins to turn to opposing error, he begins this next section with a connection. He says in verse 7, the first word of verse 7 is what? For. For. And this is a conjunction, and this conjunction is causative. A conjunction ties what's been said to what's about to be said, and what's about to be said back to what's been said. He's not starting a new topic here. He's continuing. And so the word for is a causative conjunction, meaning because. That's what a causative conjunction is. It means because. It serves to link what comes from verse 7 and beyond back to what was said before, and specifically what was said immediately before. Look at verses 5 and 6. And in verses 5 and 6, John reiterates the command that, that he says we had from the beginning. And this commandment is that we love one another. Here's how he says it in verse 5. And now I beseech thee. The word beseech means to plead. It means to implore. It means to beg. Uh, John says, Now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. That's the commandment that we had from the beginning, that we love one another. The beginning of Christianity, the beginning of our walk with Christ, the beginning of the disciples' walk with Christ, all the way back, Jesus taught them, it was his command to them and through them to us, that we love one another. Now, love is important among the body of Christ. Love is important in a church. It's of utmost importance. Now, this is different. This love that he's talking about here is different than the love that God has for the world. It's different than the love that you and I are to have for our neighbors. And it's different than the love that you and I are to have for our enemies. We are to love our enemies, Jesus told us. You have heard that it hath been said, uh, love your friend, hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies. And so we are to love our enemies. Love is important. And loving our enemies is a command from Jesus Christ. Loving our neighbor. Remember, that was the second command that was like unto the first, that we're to love God, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. But our neighbor is an, in, is an indescript, a general uh, it's the love of humanity. It's the love of people wherever they be. And Jesus dis defined a neighbor when they said, and who is my neighbor? Uh, it's different than that, and it's different than the love that God has for the world. Okay? Are we to love the world? We are to love the world in the sense of the people who, for whom Christ died. 
But we are not to love the culture or the system of the world because it was John in his first epistle that said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life, is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we are to love the world in the sense that God so loved the world. That's talking about humanity. That's talking about the people of the world. We are to love the world. But we are not to love the system described in three parts. uh, Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's this world's system that is without God. But what John is interested in, and he introduced it in his first epistle, he talks about in his gospel, it comes straight from Jesus Christ, and he reiterates it here in the second epistle, is love of the brethren. It's Christian love among Christians. And it's so important. That's the command that we had from the beginning. Then he says in verse 6, and this is love. Now he doesn't just tell us to love, He tells us what love is. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. And here he links it back with truth. And it was love and truth, truth and love, truth over and over in the first six verses uh, coupled with love. And so this love is, is mingled with truth and cannot be divorced from truth. This is the commandment, he says, that as you have heard uh, from the beginning, you should walk in it. Then the very next word, the word that begins our text for today is for. It means because. Love one another, keep his commandments, walk in this love because. A connection. Then building off of this connection, John moves directly into a caution. Why is this love among, in the Christian community so important? Why is this love among brethren, brothers and sisters in a church, so important? Why is Christian love so important? This caution is connected to the commandment. Look at what he says in verses 7 through 11. We'll read those verses again. For, or because, many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker whoa, of his evil deeds. John's caution in this section is in regards to two main things. The enemies of the faith, and the emphasis of the faith. First, John, as he connects this caution to the commandment, alerts us instantly to the enemies of the faith. We've said it before that faith is always going to be tried. And and the trial of your faith comes from multiple directions. But there is an enemy. There is a declared enemy that the Bible declares, that God himself declares, and he's called an adversary. And he's described as the devil, for your adversary, the devil. We have an enemy, and he is the devil. He is powerful, but he's not all powerful. He is present, but he's not all present. He is knowing, but he's not all knowing. Only God occupies those things. But he knows us. He is aware of our weaknesses and our tendencies. And he is the tempter, he is the devil, he is described as a deceiver and a serpent. In fact, the first time we encounter him in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3, and and he's pictured as a serpent. He's cunning, he's crafty, he's divisive, and he's venomous. The enemies of the faith, that's what John alerts us to instantly, is the enemies of the faith. He says this in verses 7 and 8. For, notice, many deceivers. Why why is truth so important? Why is love so important? Why is it important that I walk in love and that I walk in truth? Why is it important that in truth I love you? 
and you love me. Why is this important? John makes that connection. He says, because for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Uh, John notes here first their deception. He says, for many deceivers are entered into the world that confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The deception of these deceivers is concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ. They target immediately the main thing the central, foundational, fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Some call it Christology. It's, who Je it's the person and work of Jesus Christ. They target first and foremost and primarily the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now, when we think of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, we may think of His humanity. And of course it includes that. But it includes much more than just the humanity or the human side of Jesus Christ. These Gnostics during those times, they were called Docetists and they denied the humanity of Christ. They said that he was not a real man, that he was an aberration. He was a spirit that appeared to be a man, but he wasn't really a man. They denied the humanity of Christ and in so doing attacked the incarnation which is declared plainly in the Bible and undermined the faith. They undermine Christology or Christology, however you want to pronounce it. This, uh, this wasn't a minor thing. In fact, John says this is a deceiver and an antichrist. It's interesting that whenever I use the word antichrist, uh, most people know what I'm talking about. We're very, very familiar with that word. It may surprise some to to find out that John is the only one that used it, and he only uses it in First and Second John. Nowhere else in the Bible does the word Antichrist appear. He's called the son of perdition. He's called the man of sin, uh, and so on and so forth. But only John calls him Antichrist, but that's the name that is stuck. That's the name. He's called the beast in the book of the Revelation. But Antichrist. Now, he did, he's not talking about the Antichrist, though he is kind of alluding to that. He says this man is a deceiver and an Antichrist, meaning that there's more than one, which he indicated in his first epistle. He said, for there are many Antichrists gone out into the world, whereby we know that it is the last time. And so uh, many Antichrists are entered into the world. John says these of these deceivers that they confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. When the person of Jesus Christ is undermined, the gospel itself is undermined. That's why Christology is the, the fundamental, the central doctrine of the Christian faith. There are other doctrines that are very important. The doctrine of man, the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, uh, which would be part of Christology. The doctrine of salvation. Isn't it important, the means of salvation and how a man can know he's saved? Yes, that's very, very important, but all that rests on the doctrine of Christ, who Christ is and what Christ has done. Everything else answers to that and springs out of that. It's the foundation of the Christian faith, and John clearly says that the man that undermines this, the man that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now the prefix anti or anti means against. It can also mean instead of. And so because these deceivers uh, are offering an alternative version of Jesus Christ, that's what they're doing. They're offering an alternative version of Jesus Christ. Uh, they are changing Christology, and because of this, John describes them in, in, in using the harshest of language, deceiver, antichrist. We see their deception. Then, too, John points, points out their danger. He goes on to say, in verse 8, Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. By saying, look to yourselves, it means beware. Beware. It means watch out. It means look out. It means be on guard. John is telling this Christian community that he's writing to, this local church that he's writing to, 
uh, referred to as the elect lady and her children, and we looked at all that last week, he's telling them to beware, to watch out, to look out, to be on guard. John indicates that these deceivers, these antichrists, though they are gone out into the world, they still pose a threat in the church. And John links this posed threat with the believer's reward. He says that we lose not those things which we have wrought. And the word wrought means to make by work it, or, or to get by work. It's, it's, uh, uh, famil- it's related to that word. That we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. The Christian can never lose what Christ has wrought. Did you know that your salvation, the new birth, is wrought by God? The forgiveness of sins, the way of salvation, is wrought by God Himself. It is the work of Christ. We talked about the person and the work of Christ. That's what Christology is. It's the study of the person and work of Jesus Christ as it's presented to us in the Bible. Salvation is wrought by Christ. It's not a cooperative thing that Christ does some and we do some. In fact, Paul said to the Galatians that if righteousness could come by any other means, then Christ is dead in vain. He died for no reason. His death means nothing if there is another way to be saved. God does not need our help to save us. We stand in desperate need of the help of God if we are to be saved. And so the Christian can never lose what Christ has wrought. That is, we cannot lose our salvation. And that's not what John is talking about here. In fact, his use of words, his terminology, is indicative of what it is that he's talking about. What Christ has wrought through the gospel secures our redemption. But what we as God's people wrought since our redemption produces our rewards. And that's what he's talking about as rewards. Look at it again. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, the things that we've worked for, Remember what Paul would say in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, right? We're not just an Ephesians 2, 8, 9 church. We are Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 church. 2, 8, and 9, very highly emphasized among our stripe and our breed, and rightly so. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our salvation is not of works on our part. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2 that follows in that trifecta of 8, 9, and 10 says that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in, in them, in the good works. We, uh, the, the life of the Christian, the walk of the Christian, your life ought to be marked incessantly by good works we ought to go about doing good we ought to be a kind people we ought to be a caring people we ought to be a compassionate people we ought to be a people that has convictions and concern convictions in our own lives and concern for others we are to be marked by good works what are good works whatever God says to do if you love me keep my commandments it's obedience to, the, to God through His Word. It's knowing what God wants us to do generally as, as relate in His Word and specifically, by the way. Now, don't ever lean too, so heavily on the specific that you neglect the general. Here's what I mean by that. Generally speaking, and I call it general because it goes for everybody, there are things that the Bible indicates that God wants all Christians to do. And so generally speaking, we're all to do those things. We know what we're supposed to do. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do what you know to do. You say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do in this area of my life, or I've been praying and I've been fasting and I can't get, I don't know what, I can't sense the leading of God. I don't know what God wants me to do here. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do what you know to do, what's declared in His Word. Now, that's not the only way God leads. That may come as a shock to some of you. Through His Word is not the only way that God leads. You okay? He leads us by His Holy Spirit. The still, small voice of God. Now, that does not give... Let me me be very clear. That does not give us license 
to do what we want to do and blame it on God. Well, I believe this is what God wants me to do. Honey, you better believe it with all the conviction of your heart because you're going to answer to God for it. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll say, well, I feel like God's leading me in this direction. Now, I know what God wants me to do for sure, generally speaking, but specifically. For example, there's no verse in the Bible and no uh, phrases in the Bible, no words in the Bible that I can use to indicate that God has called me specifically to be a missionary to China, which he did. And remember, I was there. How did I know? Did I know that? Was I just like rolling dice and seeing how it all worked out? Was I playing a roulette with my life and the life of my wife and children? Or was I convinced with strong conviction that God was leading me and my family to China? The latter. I was convinced with strong conviction that that's what I knew that's what God wanted me to do. Now, I couldn't show you in the Bible where it says, Bruce, I want you to go to China or anything like that. I can show you generally that he wants me to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. But I can do that from here, and we do it through our missions given and through going door to door and so on and so forth, passing out gospel tracts. Uh, we can do it that way. But how did I know that he wanted me to go to China? It was through the leading of the Holy Spirit. I was convinced that that's what God wanted me to do because God convinced me of it. Now, never lean more heavily on, the, on that than you do on what he generally wants you to do. If you're not doing what you know he wants you to do through the Bible, he's not leading you in those other areas. He's constantly pushing you back to that. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do what you know to do. And you do what God has revealed he wants you to do. And when we do what God wants us to do, when we live according to the will of God, generally and the will of God specifically for our lives individually, we are working. John uses the word wrought. And obedience, as Brother Daniel mentioned in Sunday school this morning, results in what well, he talked about, disobedience resulting in chastening from God for the child of God, and obedience resulting in communion with God. And that's true. Now we go a step further. Not only do we have communion with God, we get rewards for it. There are rewards in the Bible associated with our obedience after we're saved. We're not working to be saved. We're working because we're saved, and we get rewarded for that. Does that make sense? And that's what John is talking about here. These deceivers come out, and they undermine the faith, the Christian faith, primarily concerning the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And if they are successful in the life of Christians, which some of these Christians were being deceived by them, they do not lose their salvation. What happens is that they lose their rewards or part of them, and John uses the phrase, did you see that there in the last two words of verse 8? Or the last three words, a uh, what? Full reward. They may get a partial. Some of the stuff's going to burn up. Some of it's going to last. John's uh, desire is that every child of God receive a full reward when he stands before God. And that's what he's talking about. If we are deceived by the deceivers and antichrist, if we turn aside, backslide, or go astray, we can lose our rewards. John's desire, which is indicative of God's desire, is that we receive a full reward. And so as John issues this caution, he warns us concerning the enemies of the faith. There are many. Do the Docetists still exist today? All these things exist in perpetuity as far as the, this world is concerned, they change their names. The names are changed to hide the guilty and to target the innocent. Do you know of any groups? Can you think of any groups that are in Christological era, error, Those that say that he is not God. Those that see, say he is a God, not the God. They're enemies of the faith. 
They are not our brothers. They are not our sisters. They are not fellow Christians. John issues a a caution concerning the enemies of the faith. Then beyond the enemies of the faith, John goes on to highlight the emphasis of the faith. Look at what he says in verses 9 through 11 of our text. Whosoever transgresseth, that's an interesting word, we'll look at it in a moment, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. John emphasizes here what he has been emphasizing throughout. He calls it here the doctrine of Christ. Now, it's the first time he uses the phrase. He uses it two times directly, and then he says this doctrine. So three times in, this, in these verses right here that make up this portion of our text, John talks about the doctrine of Christ. It's what he's been talking about the whole time since he began his gospel. Remember the gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It's Christology, and the Word was God. To deny that is to deny the very Word of God. If you deny that the Word is God, you deny the Word of God. It's called the doctrine of Christ. That's what the Bible calls it. The word doctrine just means teaching. And so it's the teaching of Christ. And I would submit to you this morning that it's the objective teaching of Christ, though we could include the subjective teaching of Christ. That means that not only is it the teaching that Christ taught, but it's the teaching of the Bible regarding the person and work of Christ. Christ is the object of the teaching, not just the subject of it. But both are true. John is interested in the doctrine of Christ or Christology. What the Bible says concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. That's the doctrine of Christ. He uses this phrase twice in verse 9, and then he uses the phrase this doctrine in verse 10, which is a clear reference back to the doctrine of Christ previously mentioned. The word doctrine simply means teaching. That's what it means. Doctrine, teaching. And so, uh, is doctrine a good thing? Depends. There's doctrine of devils talked about in the Bible. You know, now you and I need to know something about what the Bible says about devils, but we don't need to know what the devils are teaching, right? There's the uh, doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees, what they taught. It just means teaching, and so the doctrine of Christ is referring to the teaching of Christ. In particular, it's what the apostles, including John, taught concerning Jesus Christ. It refers generally to the person and work of Christ. But, but John has been interested in, a, uh, what he's been interested in is a particular aspect of the doctrine of Christ. We mentioned it earlier, and it's this, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. As he warned about the enemies of the faith, he said in verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's the main thing he's talking about here. They confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That was their deception. He wasn't talking about their teachings in general, though that would be, uh, they were wrong too because the foundation was wrong, but specifically their teaching concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ, his coming in the flesh. In his first epistle, John linked, he linked it to what he called the sin unto death. Remember that? He said there is a sin unto death. We called it the unpardonable sin. And we noted that it's not like some teach suicide. Nowhere in the Bible will you find Suicide as being an unpardonable sin despite the reasoning and the logic behind it. I mean, there is some uh, logic, there is a large logical argument for it. Because to be forgiven for sins, we have to confess our sins. If we kill ourselves, we're not alive to confess it, so we can't receive forgiveness for it. 
You can jump through hoops and do word puzzles all day long, but the truth of the matter is suicide is not the unpardonable sin. There is only one sin that is unto death. All other sin is not unto death, but there's only one sin that's unto death, and that has to do with Jesus Christ. That has to do with rejection of the person and work of Jesus Christ. There is, because neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way to God, the only way to salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And to ultimately and finally reject Jesus Christ is to sin a sin unto death and death being eternal separation from God. Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. The doctrine of the incarnation is central to the gospel. It's the one doctrine among many Christian doctrines. It's the one doctrine that a person cannot afford to get wrong. I've shared with you before, Daniel and I worked uh, with a Muslim 20, how long ago was that now? 22, 23 years ago. And we would talk about Christianity, you know, if I get an opportunity. And he would talk about Islam. And his contention, his argument was, most of what we believe is very similar. And maybe he was right. You know, maybe, maybe some of the peripherals, it looks the same. I said, Mahmoud was his name. And I said, Mahmoud, the, the one thing that I know that we do not agree on is who Jesus Christ is. We believe that he is the Son of God. We believe that he is God incarnate, meaning God in the flesh, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, which means, according to Matthew one twenty three, you can write that verse in your notes. Matthew one twenty three. That at the end of it, he says, his name shall be called, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The child, Jesus, is God. That's what that verse says. It makes no bones about it. It says that the child, Jesus, is that, that's to be born of the virgin, is God in the flesh. God with us. John in his own gospel said, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. No mistaking there. It's very, very clear. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe today that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? Do you believe that God became a man for the sole intent of dying for the sins of man that he might offer salvation through his own shed blood on Calvary's cross and subsequently his resurrection from the dead on the third day. That's the sole reason he came. Do you believe that today? It's paramount to believing that if you are to be saved, if you are to be born again, if you are to be a child of God. If you do not believe that, you are not saved. You are not a Christian, though you may self-identify as one. By the way, and our, and our culture has served to highlight this, just because you identify something does not make that a reality. Now, that's always been true. You can self-identify as a Christian. It doesn't make you a Christian. One thing makes a person a Christian. Faith toward God, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Confessing with the mouth, the Lord Jesus, believing in the heart that God hath raised him from the dead, that's what makes a person saved. Confessing that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and turning to God and accepting the gift that he is offering to the whole wide world, including you. Have you ever done that? If you've never done that, if you've never called on him, if you've never accepted him, if you've never received him, all of these are words that are used synonymously throughout Scripture. Believe, receive, call on. If you've never done any of that, then you are not born again. You have been born one time, born of the flesh, and that's it. 
You can identify as a Christian. You can say, I'm a Christian. And you can base that on any number of things. It does not make it so. One thing makes it so. and That is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul. That's what makes a Christian. Are you saved today? Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you ever had a time in your life where you've committed your life to him, where you've said to him, Lord, I'm a sinner in some words, and it doesn't have to be, there's no exact magical prayer, but something to the effect, the effect Lord, I'm a sinner, and I'm separated from you from my sin, but I know Jesus Christ died for me. I know you sent your son to die for me, and that death was a, ju a judicial transaction whereby he died to pay for my sins, and because of that, my sins may be blotted out, and I may receive a poor full pardon from the God of heaven. And Lord, I receive that. I accept that. I, identif I, I confess that with my mouth. I agree with God that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I'm asking you to save me based on what Jesus Christ has done for me. Wash me with this blood. Cleanse me. And that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. If you've never done anything like that, you're not saved. If you have, you know God, and God knows you. And you can do it today if you've never done it before, and I encourage you and implore you to do it. The incarnation that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is central to the gospel in that it proves at least three major things. It proves the deity of Christ, that is, that he is God. It proves the humanity of Christ, that is, he is a man fully man, fully God, and it proves what we've talked about before, that union, what theologians call the hypostatic union. It just means uh, the God being and the human being in one person called Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ, and that's what the incarnation teaches about Jesus Christ. That's what it means. And if someone denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, they're denying all of that. Remember that these deceivers, these particular ones that John is warning about, that he refers to in both his first and second epistles using the word antichrist, these deceivers, these many deceivers, are not offering or proposing alternatives to Christ. I think in this room, probably in this room, <clears throat> there would scarcely be a person who would accept an alternative to Christ. If someone came saying you have to believe in Muhammad or you have to believe in Buddha or you have to believe in one of the many, many, many Hindu gods or you have to uh, do this or believe in that one apart from Jesus Christ, probably in this room no one's going to buy that. No one's going to bite on a bait like that. And these Gnostics knew that. These in the community of the elder, John, the last remaining apostle, the others have been gone, uh, their lives are over, it's been probably 25, maybe 30 years, and John's the only apostle left. He's the only person left on the planet who saw Jesus Christ in the flesh before his death, burial, and resurrection. He's the only one left. And he is the elder of these. He, they revere him. They are acquainted with his teachings. They are familiar with what he's taught. They know that he was there. And that if there is any human authority on the person and work of Christ, it's the elder, it's John. It's the apostle. They know that. And so they're not likely to be fooled by an alternative to Christ. But as we said last week, these Gnostics aren't offering an alternative to Christ. They are proposing and offering alternatives of Christ. It's still Jesus Christ. There are groups in our day that still use the name Jesus Christ who loosely are under the umbrella of Christendom, right? Although they don't necessarily self-identify as Christians, they do still use the name of Jesus Christ. If a Muslim knocks on your door and tries to convert you to Islam, you're probably not going to be very easily persuaded being a believer in whatever degree you are, of Jesus Christ. Notice they're not the ones coming to your door. 
Who are the ones that come to your doors? There are two groups mainly, right? Two groups mainly. You already know who they are. Some of them ride bicycles. I don't know if they still do that or not. And they're called elders, interestingly enough. And they don't look much older than Nate. And yet they got this thing that says elder on it. I was suspicious already. You don't even shave yet. Do they use the name Jesus Christ? Interestingly enough, they claim even to use the King James Bible. They don't. I remember seeing as a kid commercials, I don't know if they still have them or not, but it would be the King James Bible, and then it would say another testament of Jesus Christ, and it would be the Book of Mormon, and they would lay it on top of the King James Bible. I was just a kid. I didn't know what it meant. I remembered it later when I got saved, and I thought, that's a bad thing to do. That's a really bad thing to do. First of all, there is no other testament of Jesus Christ. He didn't come over here and start a new thing with the Mormons. Oop, did I say that out loud? You already knew who I was talking about. And then there's another group out there, too. They're called the Jehovah's Witnesses. Not neither of those groups are fundamental in their view or biblical in their view of who Jesus Christ is. The Mormons will teach you that he is a God. That his father is not even the God, but also a God. And the Mormons teach this. As man is, so God was. That as God is, so man may become. And I'm not here to teach you all the things about Mormon. Uh, this is not a Mormonological message. Amen? But they believe Elohim, the father of Jesus, is a God. Of, he's our God here. But out there, there are many other gods over other planets and and things like that, and that Mormons, if you really are a good Mormon and, do, and go through all the different ranks and all the different things, that you can ascend ultimately to Godhood yourself. Elohim started as, God the Father started as a man, a good Mormon man, and worked his way up to Godhood. He had two sons, their brothers, Lucifer and Jesus. And the only reason Lucifer is, is uh, the devil today is because daddy hurt his feelings by choosing Jesus instead of him to come be our Savior. And he's not really bad. His feelings are just hurt because daddy chose Jesus instead. That's blasphemy. To say that the Son of God is the brother of the devil is blasphemy. Jesus is not a created being, though Mormons believe he is. He said, I am the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. I have neither beginning of days nor end of years. I never started, I never end. From everlasting to everlasting, I am God. That's Jesus Christ. They don't believe that. They believe he's a God, but not the God. And the Jehovah's Witnesses will argue and they'll spend their entire time with you attempting to convince you one thing jesus is not god he's created by god yes he's the savior but he's a created savior created by god and that's not true and the only reason i'm calling names i'm not here to bash other people you know me you know that that's not my my style is because john said these are deceivers and antichrist who those who deny that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, those who deny the incarnation and thereby, by default, deny the deity of Christ, that he is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ in the flesh is God in the flesh. They deny the humanity of Christ. Some of them, remember, there were the Docetists, there were the Ebionites, let me re reverse that, there were the Ebionites, there were the Docetists, and there were the Serenthians. 
during that time that 1 John was written, during this time that these were written. And the Ebonites denied the deity of Christ, the Docetists denied the humanity of Christ, and the Serinthians denied the hypostatic union. You don't have to remember all those. None of that's going to be on the test. Those people are dead and gone, and they know the truth now better than you and I know it. But it's forever too late for them because they committed the unpardonable sin. They ultimately and finally rejected the only way God has made or, and that God could have made for mankind to be saved, and that is Himself in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us, dying for our sins that we might be saved through him. And so these weren't offering alternatives to Christ. We'd never buy. That's why the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Muslims don't go door to door. Instead, at least not in our country, they don't. Because we are a Christian country. And even people that don't know Jesus Christ still say they're Christian and still uh, claim to believe in Jesus Christ. And so we're not going to fall for an alternative to Him, but many fall for an alternative of Him. Yes, Jesus Christ, but He's a God, not the God. Yes, Jesus Christ, but He's a man, not God. And whatever version or offspin or offshoot from that. Notice a reality here concerning this caution. He says in verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. We, talk, we talked about that word. We said we'd come back to that word transgresseth. It means to go by the side of, uh, to go past or to pass over. It means to go too far or to cross the line or to get out of the bounds that were previously set. What you and I believe about Jesus Christ is bound by this here book called the Bible. Our belief of the person and work of Christ is to be garnered from this Bible. The transgressors he's talking about are those who go beyond what the Bible teaches. They go aside from what the Bible teaches. He says they transgress. They go too far. They take liberties that are not theirs to take. They draw conclusions that are not biblical to draw. And we've already talked about what those conclusions are. They overstep. They go past as to turn aside from or to depart from. That's what transgresseth meaning. God has revealed who Jesus Christ is. And to go beyond that, to alter that, to overstep that, to turn aside from that, to depart from that in any way is a transgression. And, and John says, and this is the reality, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Oh, wow. That means that those groups that we mentioned, along with these groups here, they're, they're not Christians who are confused. Not according to John. These aren't people who are ignorant of it or they haven't been around it much and they still have questions or they're new to it and they're just, they they don't, you know, none of us had all the answers when we first started. And by the way, none of us have all the answers now. We're still learning. We're still growing. We're still maturing in the faith. We're still studying the Bible. By the way, that's a big book. And there's a lot there. And John is not talking about people who are ignorant of it, people who just don't know, people who haven't grown, people who still have questions, and maybe they're off a little bit here, off a little bit there. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those that confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He's talking about those that attack the fundamental doctrine of of the Bible called Christology, the study of the person and work of Christ. And he said that... They transgress, they abide not in the doctrine of Christ, and they have not God. 
And he goes on to say, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. A reality. Here's the thing. You abide in the doctrine of Christ? You believe in the person? You may not know a bunch of other things on the outside. I remember when I first got saved, Brother Danny, and I've told this testimony many times. I was saved April 2nd of 1996. That's coming up on Tuesday. All right? By the way, as an aside, my wife just walked out probably to go get food ready. But as an aside, tomorrow is April 1st of 2024. 20 years ago exactly tomorrow, on April 1st, 2004, her and I and Bruce, who's back there, and Bobby, who's in Georgia, got on a plane in Houston, Texas, bound for Harbin, China. That was 20 years ago tomorrow. And we spent 10 years as missionaries to China. That's 20 years ago. That's just an aside. The next day, April 2nd, while we were in transit, that's like a 30-hour flight, plus you change, you know, uh, you go over the international date line and, you know, that's not where you search for a partner. Uh, international date line, and I mean, it's, so we left here the first, we got there the third. What happened to the second? It was just gone. I didn't get to live April the 2nd of 2004. So, if y'all find it, let me know. <laughs> I wonder what, what happened on that day. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. John says you're saved. You're saved. On April the 2nd of 1996, I heard the gospel for the first time. I was at my grandpa's funeral, my grandpa that raised me. I wasn't raised in church. I didn't know the man that was preaching. He was a preacher that was unacquainted with my family, didn't know my grandpa. He came in with one mission to preach the gospel in a funeral to people that he had a good reason to believe did not know Jesus Christ. And he preached the gospel, and it was the first time I'd ever heard it, and I knew it was true, and I believed it that day. April the 2nd of 1996, I became a Christian. I was born again because I said, God, I know you're real. I've never known you before, never talked to you before, but I know you're real. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm separated from you. I know what this man is saying is true. I've never met him before, never read that book, never heard that message, but I know it's true. And he says that if I ask you, you'll save me. And I know that's true. And so I'm asking you to forgive me and to save me based on what Jesus has done. And at that very moment, I became a child of God. Forever and forever, a child of God. Now, what did I know at that moment? I knew there was a God. I knew his son, Jesus Christ, had died for my sins and that he had saved me. And that's about all I knew. I didn't own a Bible, didn't have a Bible. There was never a Bible in my house growing up. I didn't know any Bible verses. I'd never been to church. I wasn't a church goer. I didn't know anything else, but I knew that. If that's all you know, you know enough. Now, you, from there you grow. But before you can grow, there's something you have to know. There's someone you have to know, and that someone is Jesus Christ. That's the reality. And John says it this clearly. Somebody said, well, my problem with the Bible is it's so hard to understand. Let me see if you can understand this. Whoso transgress, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. That's pretty clear. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. That's pretty clear. A reality. Then, too, we see a response. John says in verses 10 and 11, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, notice, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. John says here, in effect, concerning our response to such as these, number one, don't even consider them. Don't even consider them. Does that mean we can't witness to them? It does not mean that we're commanded to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And on occasion, I've had, time, I, I've had the opportunity to meet these out on the street corner, something to that effect. And I share the gospel with them when I have the opportunity. But don't consider them. He says, if there come any unto you. Now, you're not happening upon them out down at Discovery Green where they like to set up their booths and all their stuff and try to get passers by. I've got a very close friend that's a very close friend to this church named Kevin Murdoch who loves to go over there and talk to him. 
If there come any unto you, he says, and bring not this doctrine, what? The doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? Christology, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that he's God in the flesh, that he's fully God, fully man, fully God and fully man in one person. If they don't bring that doctrine, receive him not into your house. Who is it? It's the Jehovah's, it's elder so-and-so. Sorry, you're not welcome here, sir. Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. First, receive him not into your house. Don't let him in your house. In our day, this would apply specifically and directly to the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Don't let, they're going to say, well, we just want to do a Bible study. We just want to see what the Bible says. No, you don't. You want to tell me what the Book of Mormon says, which is not the Bible. And you want to tell me what the New World Translation says, which is not the Bible, and what the Watchtower says the New World Translation says. Because you're not even confident in the New World Translation. There's nothing there to prove you wrong. And so you don't want to just tell me what the New World Translation says. You want to tell me what the Watchtower says the New World Translation says I'm to believe. You're not welcome here. Don't even consider them. Yeah, but I think that I can hold my own. John said, don't even consider them. Don't even consider them. Then too, John essentially says, concerning our response to such, don't ever condone him. Not only don't consider them, don't condone them. Look at what he goes on to say. Neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. God's speed, it means a salutation, a farewell, a, a well-wishing, a, a God bless you maybe, or a goodbye, which originally, apparently, meant something to the effect of God be with you. That's uh, what goodbye means when you say goodbye to someone. Now, that's not necessarily what you mean when you say goodbye, but that's what it, my, my, my studies indicate, that's why I wasn't back there, but that's what they say. That goodbye means God be with you. John is saying here, don't say anything in their departing that could be seen as condoning them in any way. They are false teachers of the worst kind. They have denied the Father and the Son. They have committed the sin that John describes as being unto death. And what's more, they are attempting to recruit others and to deceive others. By the way, I have heard of true Christians being led astray into that stuff. In fact, there was at one time when the Jehovah's Witnesses boasted that their number one uh, field of proselytization was Baptist churches. That's where they found the most fertile ground for their doctrines. Baptist churches. I don't know if that's true or not. But what a sad testimony if it is. Or if it was. Don't bid them Godspeed. Listen, it's good to be gracious, courteous. We're told to be courteous. To be gregarious, to be hospitable, but not to the extent of truth as it relates to the person of Jesus Christ. And I remind you that John isn't talking about those who are confused about Christ those who are ignorant about Christ, those who simply don't know and are still learning, he's talking here in our text specifically about those who have apostatized. They were professing Christians. Remember, just because you identify something doesn't make you that. They were professing Christians. They were part of the community of believers, though they were imposters. And they had been exposed to, to tr the truth concerning Jesus Christ. Those that John was referencing back in 1 John 2.19 when he said they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. We are of God. If they are of us, they too are of God. They're not of God, therefore they're not of us. Therefore, eventually, they went out from us. But they weren't content just going out. Now they're trying to reach back and pluck others to go with them. That's what spurned uh, the, and spurred the writing 
of this epistle. Those who against the preponderance of the evidence confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. It's of these that John says in so many words, don't even consider them, don't ever condone them. A connection, a caution, then finally John uh, offers a conclusion. And this is where we end. The elder closes the letter by saying in verses 12 and 13, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. We're going to end the message here. Have you ever thought, I mean, when you look at it, right? First John, uh, Second John and Third John together. You can see Jude here if you can, if you got good eyes. But I'll cover up Jude. Second John and Third John combined don't even take up two whole pages of the Bible. And and John says in verse thirteen, in verse twelve, I have many things to write unto you. There's a lot more I want to say to you. He could have written a multi-page epistle. Maybe another five page like he did in there. It's significant that he adds this, that he tacks this on, and the Holy Ghost moves him to do that and then preserves it. It makes it into the canon of Scripture as part of the inspired Word of God. Every Word of God is there on purpose and for a purpose. So even the greetings and the salutations, the benedictions, the postscripts, all, all of these things are important. Now, I'm not going to preach these last two verses. I just want to note uh, one thing primarily. If he had many things to write, he didn't write them, but he did take the time to write this, though it's such a short letter. So short. Why even bother? If you're, if you're going to see them face to face, why not just tell them all of it at one time? Well, first, history doesn't tell us whether he ever made it to that church. So we don't know if he ever made it there. There were many other things he wanted to say, but there was, one, there was something he had to say. This went beyond what he wanted to tell them. He had to, they had to have this. This is so important that although it only took 11 verses, if you take out 12 and 13, which is the postscript, if you, if you just include the body of it, it's just a few verses. It barely gets into double digits. It was so important that he wrote it anyway. This is a big deal. The... the Christology, what you believe about Jesus Christ is the biggest of deals. Nothing is more important to, than that. And if I only have time to write one thing to you, and I have to save everything else that I'm just eager to tell you about, if I, if I can only write one thing, I'm going to write to you concerning the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He has come in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. He is fully God. He is fully man in one person. Not half God, half man. Not a mixture of the two. But somehow, in only a way that God could fathom, He is all God, all man, in one person. And He came that you and I might have life. That we might be forgiven of our sins. And that we might be put into a relationship with God the Father through God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? I have a question for you. Are you saved? Regardless of your age, young or old, if you can understand what I'm saying, God is inviting you to come to Him. Are you saved? Do you know for sure that you know Jesus Christ? Nothing else is more important. We love to have you at Candlestick Baptist Church. You're welcome in this church. We'll do everything we can to help you, to assist you, to aid you, to ensure that you grow, that you have your needs met. We'll do everything that we can to love you, to have compassion on you. But nothing's more important than your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I want you to answer this question in your heart. Am I safe? Am I sure I'm saved? The answer to any other questions that you may have pale in comparison to the answer to this question. 
Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Through believing in him, you can have life in his name. Our pianist is going to begin to play an invitational. Our altars are open. If God has spoken to your heart through this message and you want to pray, maybe you want to thank God for truth. Maybe you want to commit to Christian love. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ or you know someone that doesn't know him and you want to come get saved or you want to come pray for somebody that you know needs to get saved. You can come to the altars. You can come to these front pews. You can pray from right where you are. All right, you may be seated. I'll make just a few announcements. We'll go back here and eat together and be back in here at 1.30 for our afternoon service. Now, I'm a traditionalist, but I'm not your traditional traditionalist. I know that many on, a, on this day in particular are expecting to hear a message on the resurrection. I know some churches have more than one service in a day, but it's the same service, and you... I heard somebody say, are you going to the early service or the late service? Well, I'm going to go to the early service because i got stuff to do. Well, I'm going to go to the late service because I want to sleep in. It's the same service repeated twice. Some churches do that because they've got so many people. They can't fit everybody in one service, so they have two services. Same service. Uh, that's not us. Our 130 service, completely different message. Okay, it's not a repeat of the same message. Uh, we can get everybody, sometimes we have to suck our bellies in, but we can get everybody in here in a, in a one service, all right? You know, we just cram in like sardines and we just make it work, don't we? That's how we do it here. We're a family, amen? I don't mind being this close to you. That doesn't bother me a bit. And so, uh, so the message this afternoon will be on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, and so... Uh, if you can be here this afternoon, please be here. We'll go back here and eat together. We've got uh, some good food back there. And then we'll be back in here at 1.30 for our afternoon service. Remember, our work day is coming up two weeks from yesterday. So that's April the 13th, Saturday, April the 13th from 9.30 to 3. What can I expect on a work day at Candlestick Baptist Church? Well, this particular work day, we typically have four work days a year that are like hard into the calendar. Two of them before our first meeting, which is missions conference in April, and then two of them before our second meeting, which is camp meeting in September. Now, in the first one, which we've already had earlier this month, we focused on this building, inside primarily, deep cleaning, getting everything. You know, we do the pews and we put the stuff on them and the panels down the hall and all that kind of stuff. This, camp, this one that we have coming up, here's the plan. We will have grounds people, we have two main people that oversee the grounds. Isaac oversees all the mowing and weed eating and all of that kind of stuff. And then Miss Brenda oversees the, uh, the flower beds, the bushes, the shrubs, all that kind of stuff. And we're probably going to be doing some, maybe some 
a uh, lot of groundwork, picking up branches, making sure the grounds are just looking really, really good, get the ditch mowed and cleaned out and get, you know, all the edging done and the weed eating and all that kind of stuff done. And then uh, weed and feed the beds. Weed means you've got to pull the weeds out by hand and then you feed it. And then maybe some mulching and some things like that. Try to make the outside look good. And then we're going to focus on the fellowship hall. And Miss Susie will be overseeing the fellowship hall and then the gym. And probably uh, John Boy will be overseeing the gym. I just have to have somebody back there. It's easier for me to tell my family, just where you're going to be, this is where you're going to be. The rest of you, you have to come and say, hey, I'd like to do something. I'd like to, you know, I'm not just going to come to you. My family, I'll just go to them, you know, and say, okay, here's what you're in charge of. So John Boy, he'll probably be in charge of the gym. We'll get the gym real clean organized, looking good. So gym, fellowship hall, and grounds are going to be the main thing. There will be some touch-up and some stuff, you know, here and there, but that'll be the main three things. We'll eat lunch together. It starts at 9.30 in the morning. If you can be here at 9.30, good. If you can't, but maybe you can come later. Maybe you can't be here till the afternoon. 9.30 to 3, any time between that time uh, is good. We want to give people plenty of time to get home and be ready for Sunday, right? We want to be here early. If you're if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you're fired. Okay, so 9.30 to 3, if you can come for all of it, if you can come for part of it, maybe you can come in the morning, but i got to leave. Maybe I can't be there in the morning, but I'll be there in the afternoon. That's fine. There will be something for you to do when you come. We'll have lunch at 12. All that we ask is you, you don't just say, well, all I could be there is from 12 to 12.30. That's lunchtime, right? It's free lunch, but you got to work for it. There is no free lunch, y'all. All right, somebody needs to tell that to some of our politicians. There's no such thing as a free lunch. All right, and our missions conference, three weeks from today. April 21st is when it starts. It's right around the corner. All right, stand with me, please. We like to try to do something every Mother's Day. Mother's Day will be May 12th. It's still a little ways, but you know how fast this time's going. It'll be here before we know it. And so, uh, usually I'll make about six racks of ribs, and some will do, maybe do some chicken or some brisket or something like that. So if you're a man, we we'll try to get the men to do it for the ladies, right? It's Mother's Day or Ladies' Day, okay? And so if you want to cook something, make something, that would be a blessing, and we'll come and we'll try to... We tried one year to serve them. We kept having to ask, well, where is this? Or what do we do with this? And it's just easier, you know. And so, well, we'll cook the meat and then get some sides and things like that and try to make it a blessing for our ladies. We appreciate all of our members and our visitors here at Candlestick Baptist Church. I want to thank our visitors for coming today. It's good to have you with us. And we've got some over here. And we thank God for you visitors. And uh, I wasn't talking about you, brother. I'm talking about them. You're not a visitor anymore. All right, you're, you're home now. You already have your pew. All right. All right. I love you, church. I thank God for you. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
do it, you cook it easy. Teamwork. Through his infinite 